good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here. A couple of things to, to begin our time together um, as it relates to some ongoing ministry opportunities that we have. Uh, a couple of things that we do annually that I want to remind you of. Uh, some of this we um, kind of laid out for the, the first time last week and just want to remind you of that now. Um, we are uh, have been asked two things that we've done in local schools during the, the month of December over the last several years is to collect turkeys for Cherokee Ridge uh, and to um, provide uh, some, spon basically sponsor uh, some students at Rossville Middle School for Christmas. Both of those schools reached out to us this week and asked if we would be able to help them again this year. So the goal for turkeys for Cherokee Ridge is, is 20. Uh, we have about half of those that, that have already um, been spoken for in, in terms of people who said that they would bring turkeys. Um, if you are able to, to help with that, please, please let me know. Uh, I'm supposed to deliver those on December the 14th. All right, so uh, coming up in just over a week. And so if you're, if you're able to help uh, with that, we would appreciate that very much. I know some people um, uh, either um, don't feel comfortable getting out shopping um, or um, would rather just provide some money and us go get however many turkeys we need. So if that's something that you want to do, uh, then just see me and we'll let you know how to do that. As far as the, uh, the students at Rossville Middle School for Christmas, um, the, the counselor there has told me that she would send me names and information. Um, and so as soon as I get that, I will distribute that to whoever is, who is interested in helping with that. Um, I do not have a date yet in terms of when they are hoping to have all of that finished, uh, but I will let you know as soon as, as possible. We also have the White Christmas Food Drive that is going on right now. Uh, you'll see in the lobby a collection of food, dry, can, uh, dry food items, canned food, uh, those, those types of things. Um, we are going to try to do something next Saturday um, to help um, maybe some of uh, our church family be able to, to participate. Um, Jenny Crystal had the idea of having a food drop-off, and so from 12 to 2, we'll have somebody at the gym on Saturday. If you guys want to just drop food off that time, um, then we'll collect it all there in the gym from 12 to 2 next Saturday. That is to help families at Chickamauga City Schools uh, for food during the, the holiday season. Also want to remind you, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering is, is going on. This is to help international missions uh, to fund uh, people who are going around the world proclaiming the gospel. And our, our goal as a church is $10,000. We'll be posting a link to this week's video. Um, I have a little bit of an issue getting that on the live stream this morning. And so um, we'll post a link to that so you can be more informed about uh, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. A couple of other things in terms of, of church business, uh, some information uh, that you'll be receiving today uh, in service, uh, and then via email if you're watching online. Um, <clears throat> the budget proposal for 2021 uh, is being made available uh, for you uh, today, and so you can look over that if you have any questions. The, there's names and phone numbers of folks that you can ask questions to, and then also uh, some deacon uh, candidates. We've got a video that we'll be showing at the end of the service. Uh, again, we'll post that um, on the church Facebook page. We'll send you a link to it in the email if you're watching online um, uh, for deacon candidates. As we get ready to, to worship this morning, Greg is going to come, and he's got a, a presentation to make this morning.
Please join us as we worship this morning. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to be again. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my
Father, ready us this morning to hear from your word. Ready us this morning to be greeted by your spirit, to illuminate truth from your word. God, help us as we pause in these next moments to, uh, to study, Father, your word that's been given to us like a, like a gift. Father, help us to not only hear these words, but to apply them, not only to call out to you, God, but to receive these truths and, and seek to put them into our lives and into action. Father, we thank you for graciously going before us, for giving us the provision of of your Son and salvation, and God, for giving us your word to guide our hearts in this life. Father, we love you and we thank you in your Son's name. Amen. (coughs) Good morning. Good morning. Come on, people. Wake up. Everybody looks a little sleepy this morning. We're going to be picking up uh, in our study in 1 Peter. Uh, we're talking about being strangers and aliens, and Peter brings us to a particular place this morning under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. He's dealing with something that we are very familiar with, and yet something that is difficult to face no matter how many times we face it. 
It's the idea of fiery trials. It's the idea of facing difficult circumstances. It's the idea of facing suffering at different points in our life. This week, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19. And we're going to take up this issue of suffering, of difficult moments, of fiery trials that come in our life. And one of the things I love about this letter in 1 Peter is that, that Peter, though he is an apostle... And he is even considered first among the apostles throughout the New Testament. He likes to present himself in many places at first as a pastor. And we'll see this really stand out even more in chapter 5. And as a pastor, what Peter aims to do is have a pastoral heart in his presentation to people. And so as he writes this letter, part of what he says you know, as a pastor that he wants to do is prepare them well. To prepare them well for suffering. You know, this is often a, an unknown part of the job description as a pastor, and that is preparing people to suffer well. Because suffering is uncomfortable, and, and in this life, more often than not, we want to talk about the good things. We want to focus on, you know, rainbows, butterflies, and unicorns, and all of life is rosy, but we know that that is not true. And though there are some who are out there who, on television channels who, who will broadcast that, you know, just turn your life over to Jesus and all things will be rosy, we, we know if you've walked with Christ for any length of time, you know that's not true. You often know that, that actually following after Christ makes your life more difficult. And while we live in the comfortable area of the South where Christianity is widely accepted in many places on the globe... To give yourself the, the claim of Christian, of Christ follower, is considered a, almost a death sentence. And so Peter would take, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God this morning, a moment to prepare his audience and echoing to us now to prepare us to suffer well. To prepare us when things are difficult for miscarriage, for cancer, for your spouse's funeral, for a child's in, uh, illness, for a, a, a job layoff. And so Peter, our, our brother Peter, Peter the pastor, would have a see that God has no ad, intention of pretending like suffering isn't real. That you just need to suck it up, buttercup, or stiffen up your upper lip and just take it. No, what he speaks to us is this, that we take up the word of the Lord in our suffering, remembering that God is not a God who is callous at all. He is rather a God who he himself was willing to take up the most heinous act of suffering possible. And I'm convinced this morning that in this passage that Peter would have us uh, leave here not with answers to every particular question as to why or how or what God is doing in the midst of our suffering, but rather to, to leave us trusting that God is both sovereign and good even in the midst of our suffering. To see that through our limited and finite perspective, to see that God who has called us loved, that God has pursued us relentlessly and unbelievably. So if you'll join me in chapter 4, beginning in verse 12 this morning, we'll read together. He says, beloved. There's power in that word. There's emotion behind that first word. He says, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to, the, to, but to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you were reviled for the name, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as murderer or as thief or as evildoer or as a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. For it is time for, it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, <coughs> what will be <clears throat> the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter is imploring them to remember who God is and remember the promises that he's made even in the midst of fiery trial. 
And so he says all of this, and and what he's doing for us this morning is he's doing something that happens commonly in Scripture. He's going to say, not this, but that. There are many places in Scripture where we're instructed along those lines of of not this, but that. Like when Paul wrote the the letter to uh, the Colossians, and he told them to put away anger and wrath and malice and slander, but to put on love and kindness and compassionate hearts. He says, not this, but that. And Peter's going to do the same thing. He says, there's something that we say no to, and there's something that we say yes to. And I feel like at the very outset, we might want to put a warning label on this passage in this not this but that, because at first glance, hey, look up here, folks. At first glance, this sounds insane. What Peter is asking us to do sounds crazy. He says, do not be surprised at suffering when it comes, but instead rejoice. When, su- when suffering shows up in this life, Peter would have us be prepared in such a way that we don't treat it with shock and awe and surprise, but rather we say, I've been expecting you. It's a mental place. It's a position where we understand that suffering will come our way. But I want to do something this morning is this, is lay out five reasons why I know that Peter isn't crazy. In my life, I've had the opportunity to, to have some unique experiences one of my favorite experiences was going to, to seminary and, and doing some training for, for, uh, for instruction, and, and it was a great experience, a great season of my life. I worked on the grounds crew at the seminary, and so most days I'd be cutting grass and weed eating and doing those types of things. And uh, One unique thing was, because I worked on the grounds crew, uh, several of the people who are retired professors would have folks from the grounds crew, would pay them extra to come do their yards. And so there was one gentleman, his name was Dr. David T. Bird. David was in his, Dr. Bird was in his late 80s, and and he would have me come work at his house. And remember, he was a professor for his entire life, and so the cool thing was he would pay me $15 an hour no matter what I was doing. Sometimes I'd be shoveling mulch in 90 degrees, and sometimes I'd be changing light bulbs in his house, but either way, it was $15 an hour. But you could always guarantee for at least 45 minutes he would give me a time of, he'd have me sit down and he'd give me instruction. <laughs> it's just his, his thing. Well, one night, uh, you know, Tara and I were living in uh, seminary housing, just the, the, the apartments that are on campus. It's about 1030 at night and I get a phone call. And I hear this shaky voice on the phone that says, I'm looking for Sean Maxwell. Well, this is Sean. Well, this is David T. Bird. And he goes into this really long spiel about how he needs help doing his lawn. And I thought to myself, he's lost it. This man's crazy. He, he is no longer, you know, understanding things. And then he busts out laughing and says, I'm just messing with you, Sean. I need you to come do my yard. <laughs> Caused me to almost have a heart attack thinking this man had gone crazy. There can be a tendency in us to, to think when we hear something that, that is like this that, that maybe Peter has, has gone crazy just a little bit. But what I want to do is, is give us five reasons why this is not insane, this is not crazy, where we can hear this and we can, uh, when we suffer, we can rejoice. It seems counterintuitive. It seems like what we would not do, but it's what Peter is instead calling us to do. First and foremost, he says, we are beloved. He starts off with that introductory word, this paragraph, that we are beloved. Suffering does not mean that we are not God's beloved. I think Peter is anticipating a a certain line of thinking when it comes to our suffering. We might think like this. Well, God is is utterly sovereign, and all things fall in the palm of his hand. And not one thing happens or is allowed to happen or brought into existence without his permission, and I'm suffering right now. And God could stop it, but he chose not to, and therefore God must be against me. And what we might follow is this poisonous thread of thinking in our mind is, is what have I done wrong? What sin did I commit this week? Why why is it that I've not done enough to maintain God's love for me? I need to to work harder. And, And so God will stop this suffering and he'll love me again. Well, church, followers of Christ, we need to understand that this thinking is harmful because it is contrary to the gospel. It is contrary to the word of God. You are saved not by the works of righteousness that you have done, but according to his great mercy. You are justified before God because God has credited to your account the perfect obedience of Christ, his sinless life, his vicarious suffering, and his victorious resurrection. You don't suffer because you are less justified. God doesn't tether his love for you based on the works that you do for him. His love for you is rather tethered to the immovable anchor of the Father's love for his Son, 
with whom you've identified yourself with in faith. And some of us need to, to hear this. Some of us need to desperately cling to this this morning that your health problems aren't because God doesn't love you. Your financial issues aren't because God doesn't love you anymore. Your cancer, your undiagnosed illness, your marriage struggles, your wayward child, none of these things are God's waning or wearing love for you. No, God in Christ is for you. And hearing this and clinging to this, understanding that God is exerting and exercising his will in accordance to his whole power through all of his limitless resources, bending through all things together a love for you and a glory for himself. He's working with divine power to love you in the most perfect, flawless, and limitless way that is possible. To be beloved by God means you are the object of his limitless divine love. See, the, the, the love like this is not like our love. Our love is limited. We lack power and the resources to, to love fully and consistently display it towards those who are in our life. Look, I love my family, but I cannot bend time and space and history and ensure the, the, the flawless perfection of my love. Our love is limited, but God's love is not, period. And his love for us rests on you permanently in Christ. You are his beloved God's special and saving love for his bride is, is a permanent love. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul would write these words. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? If, if it is God who justifies, who is it to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sleep for the, slaughter, for the slaughter. No, in these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. <coughs> we are his beloved, and he pursues us. But this leaves us maybe possibly with a hanging question then, a question that still isn't quite answered, a question that, that is here but we can't quite grasp. And it's this rejoicing and suffering. But it, it is it, the second point this morning is, look, rejoicing and suffering is not insane because our Savior has power over suffering. He is even suffering's master, and it is serving him and therefore serving us. Look again at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you as though some strange thing were happening to you. There's two things, two phrases right here in verse 12 that maybe you can underline for yourself. It's, it's fiery trial and to test you. It says this fiery ordeal or for your testing. So if you underline those two phrases, we can see in this how <coughs> God is indeed the master over suffering. Let's flesh this out for ourselves this morning. There are fiery trials that are coming. They're coming our way. And so he doesn't skirt around this idea. He says, these are a reality. They are coming your way. This fiery trial is a language of something that is uh, divinely ordained. God is the one who sends fire. He is the one who does uh, fire and does it in, in two different ways. The first, he judges his enemies with fire. Over and over and over again through Scripture, both the Old Testament and New Testament, fire is connected with, with judgment, uh, the judgment of God over his enemies. Isaiah 66, for by fire the Lord will enter into judgment. Or in Hebrews 12, 29, God is a consuming fire. Or in Deuteronomy, the Lord is our God is a consuming fire. What I'm saying is this, is that the, these fiery trials, this is a God thing. Yes, sometimes they come through evil doers, such as when a wicked nation would come against the nation of Israel. But even those wicked nations are functioning like a sword in the hand of God. God would ask this rhetorical question over in Amos chapter 3, verse 6. He would say, does a disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? And the obvious answer to the prophet in that passage is no. 
The second thing that God does with fiery trial, which we see you know, is directly in this phrase, is to, to, to test. To test. He says this specifically. He says, for your testing. Comes upon you for your testing. He's giving you the reason behind it. He's telling you why it exists and why it is there. <coughs> it is to prove, it is to purify through trial his people. God has enslaved suffering and trial in order to serve us, just as he did with Job to display the, the authenticity of, of faith. So when you suffer trial, you cling to God in faith, and, and through it, and you refuse to curse God, and, and rather bless God, and you are magnifying his glory as he proves out the authenticity of your faith. God proves out uh, of us what is of him through trial. He purifies us through trial. He burns off this notion of self-trust. He burns off our sin. He burns off the things that are killing us, that are weighing us down, that are not serving us. And yet how easy it is to trust our own hands and our own strength until the day that, we, that it flees from us. It's hard to trust instead in the strength of the Lord who graciously allows weakness, and trials, difficulty, to burn off this illusion of, of self-trust and control. Rejoicing in suffering, and not only because the Lord is, a, is, is our true master, but as our true master, he will allow it only to serve you and not destroy you. Look, this is where I'm talking about this sounds crazy. This is one of those things that oftentimes when I, whenever I do counseling with somebody who's struggling through something difficult, I'll tell them, this is really easy for me to say, but it's going to be really hard for you to do. It, we see these words written out on a page, and we're, we're understanding that God is speaking to us, directly telling us this idea that when we face trials, that we are God's beloved. And when we face difficulty, it is for our good. But in the moment, does it feel like it? When someone in your family, is, you're watching them and you're grieving because of the suffering that they're facing, when you yourself are in the moment of difficulty and you are being eaten alive on the inside, what are you clinging to? Are you clinging to the truths of what God has promised you or are you clinging to your own strength? That's why I'm saying that maybe this seems insane because in the reality of the hurt of life, we see suffering not as a fiery trial but instead as a punishment. And Peter is saying, no, beloved, that's not what it's for. You need to understand the purpose that is behind it. I remember the cliched saying of, you know, whenever you got in trouble and you were going to get a spanking, you know, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And as Mark Lowry says, then why don't we trade places? It's this idea that suffering proves out our, the genuineness of our faith. It is for a purpose, folks. It is not simply just a callous, capricious God who wants to cause pain in our life. Third thing that we need to see from this is all who share in Jesus' suffering share in Jesus' glory. We've talked about this in different ways through Peter's letter, but it's one of the themes that shows up again. Verse 13, but to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing. That instruction, keep on rejoicing, <coughs> so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. This is the promise of this passage that it's an impossibility in the redemptive work of, of God that any of his people should experience the suffering that comes with identification with Jesus without experiencing the, the glory of identification with Jesus. Look, <clears throat> when you suffer for Christ because you're identifying with Christ, it, it always results in a blessing. The one who dies with Christ in shame rises with him in glory. If you suffer for his sake, you'll share in the glory that is for his sake. When you are insulted, when you're called a fool, a bigot, a narrow-minded loser for the sake of Christ's name, then you are blessed because the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. <laughs> what a promise that is. What a promise that is. You know, oftentimes I think that we read over something in a passage and we don't, we don't grasp the gravity of what it says. Look at that. You're blessed because the Spirit and the glory of God rests upon you. If you are, you know, insulted, if you are held to account for following after Christ, God delights to bless those who are maligned for his name and for his sake since it shows his approval is more essential to you than theirs. 
don't suffer for the sake of, of criminality or for sin or then try and claim the spirit of glory. That's why he says, look, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief. He goes into all these other things. Look, if you suffer because of sinful decisions in your life, he's saying that suffering is upon you. But if you're suffering for the name of Jesus, if you're suffering for the pursuit of the gospel, then you're suffering for something that goes beyond that of yourself. And God guarantees in this, God promises in this a a glorious gift. That's a powerful statement for us. that, That while it may feel like in the moment that we are paying the consequences in a negative and a harsh way for following after Christ, in the, end it, <coughs> in the end, it is for our good and for our value. Fourth thing, those who cause your suffering will not be able to withstand God's judgment, his furious judgment. Look at verse 16. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to, glory, is to glorify God in his name. For in for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. So judgment begins in the household of God. And if it begins first with us, those who are Christ's followers, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? A rhetorical question that he's asking there. Those who are outside the family of God, those who are sinners, those who are reviling you. The flow of Peter's argument is running through this, that there are going to be the, those people outside the church who will bring suffering into your life. And, and Peter is referring to the suffering being brought by people outside the church because he's talking about suffering as a Christian. <clears throat> and then he goes on, he says, he says in verse 18 about those who do not obey the gospel. So he's bringing us back to this idea of God testing, approving, of purifying us. Judgment begins with the house of God, with Christ followers. In other words, to prove out who is really of the house of God and purify the house of God. And this is the, one of the things that God is doing always, constantly, and is in the midst of doing so that we know through even all of the suffering that might happen at First Baptist in Chickamauga that God is proving out and purifying the genuineness of his church and of his bride. He's proving out to us who is his and who is not. But then he gives comfort in his aim to us. He says, he says that, that we might say, okay, I understand what you're doing through, through hatred and persecution of the world, but what, what about them? What are you going to do about them? It's not fair. What about these persecutors, the ones who hate and revile and reject us for the sake of Christ? And Peter responds by prayer, paraphrasing from, from Proverbs to assure us that God will not be mocked and that his people will not go unvindicated. This is another way of telling us that we don't need to be in the business of vengeance against those who hate us because God will take care of them. In our humanity, in our flesh, our tendency is to say, well, that's not fair. We want to strike out. We want to lash out. But God is saying, look, my beloved, those who are beloved, you're going to face difficulties. You're going to face trials. You're going to face difficult circumstances that are for your good and for my glory. And in those difficult circumstances of suffering, know that you are loved. And even though it may seem like those on the outside who revile you for the name of Jesus are winning, that are they are getting ahead, trust me, they are not. Leave vengeance to the Lord. He says, in the end of all things, he will reconcile this. So rejoice when you suffer hatred or rejection or persecution for the sake of Christ. And don't try and get even and don't try and get revenge because those who cause the suffering of God's people will not withstand his fury when the fiery trial arrives in the end. Fifth thing, your shepherd is both utterly sovereign and utterly faithful. We see this in verse 19. Therefore, those who also suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And if you put your, if you put your trust, if you put your faith in the right place, folks, you're fine. You, you're, you're covered. You're good. You can walk in the midst of the fiery trial and come out unscathed and unburned because you are loved. Man, this is a powerful truth. Therefore, therefore, based on all of this that he said, those who also suffer according to the will of God, woo-hoo, don't miss that. Those who suffer according to the will of God, God's will shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Peter won't just leave this, this section without emphatically assuring us that the truth is this, that there is no maverick suffering in the lives of God's people. He's sending it to, to test us. Well, who is doing this testing? God is. 
He is proving out your faith and purifying you for his use and for his glory. Who's suffering according to God's will, and these things are being part of his will, are, are a trial of suffering. So all of it, every particle of it, is under the hand of a sovereign God, and therefore we rejoice. Why? Because in his sovereignty, this shepherd is, is entrusting us to cling to him, the faithful creator. Faithful to what? Faithful to himself, to his own word, to his own promises, to his own nature, to his steadfast love, to his infinite mercy, to his intention to, forget, to, to finish the good work that he began in you, to his own divine and loving existence. And so these things are true, that, that God is totally sovereign, that God is totally for you, and that God is totally faithful. And then you can you know, move from fear and doubt in the midst of suffering, and you can move to faith and joy. Because our Creator is faithful. He is for us, and He is all-powerful, so nothing can go wrong. Nothing. <coughs> so it's not a question of when. It's not a, not a question of when. Listen, some of you right now, uh, and I mean right in this instance, are, are listening here or you're listening online. You're, you're sitting here in a chair right now and you're in the midst of tremendous suffering. Some of you I know are because I know the circumstances of your life. Some of you just finished a season of suffering. Some of you might have a suffering that is behind the scenes that nobody even knows that you're walking through. And so this is something that you need to desperately cling to. Sometimes we who are not in the midst of suffering forget the fact that this is not simply a theory, it's a reality for us as we uh, walk in this. Some of you are dealing with disease and marriage trouble and relational strife and family problems or infertility, you know, all kinds of chaos that can come in life. You're dealing with the degrading effects of the curse on your physical body, thinking back to when you lived life and things didn't hurt when things were easier. And we all need to see and, and to, to take into account with this idea that we're not suffering and that for, for no reason and that the suffering will not break us. We live in a world that is redeemed but not yet restored. Hear me. We live in a world that where in Christ we are redeemed but it is not yet restored fully. We live between the, the coming kingdom of, of Christ and <coughs> the finished kingdom glory of that kingdom. Well, Jesus will crush all of his enemies and will restore all things. So we, we listen to this. We hear this, that we need to be ready, that we need to stand firm, being ready in season and out of season to believe that the Lord is for you, that he is good, that nothing comes through his hand into your life that is not ultimately somehow a part of his great love for you. And so this morning, rhetorically, I ask you, do you believe that? Are you prepared in your faith walk, even in the midst of suffering, to confess that as truth? Be prepared to refuse the, the whisperings of the world, of the flesh, of the devil that will creep in when suffering comes your way, much like Job's wife did, saying, curse God and die. But no, instead, we believe that God is good. And what would a God do in good God do in this? If God is as good and as powerful as he claims to be, we don't need to ask this question of, of why this. Instead, our heart needs to trust the Lord. Be ready on that day to pull out the shield of faith to extinguish, extinguish the, the fiery darts that Satan would seek to throw at us. Jesus is conquering and subduing and, and enslaving even the things that, that, that seem to be causing our suffering, and he's making them to serve us and ultimately to, to serve him. So our heart needs to hear from the Lord and trust in him that we are his beloved. That even in the midst of fiery trials that will come, God is working it for our good and for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, it is so hard to, to walk in the midst of trial and to recognize that in the midst of suffering or difficulty that you, that you are working for our good. God, show us even when we don't understand, even when we can't fully comprehend, even when we don't grasp at all, that you are the one true and loving God who has pursued us relentlessly. And I know just the, the nature of people and the way that we are, that there are many in this room who are facing difficulty and trial and struggle and fiery circumstances even right now. Lord, my prayer is that you would come alongside them and that you would graciously 
remind them of these truths that we saw from your word this morning. That we are your beloved, that our suffering serves a purpose. God, that you are testing us, that we might display your righteousness and that we will be rewarded. God, help us to walk as faithful believers in a world, in a culture that speaks out against those who follow Christ. God, help us to be steadfast and firm that we might speak your name in all places and in all ways. Father, grow our hearts this morning as we sing this last song. God, invest in us these truths and help us to live them out. In your son's name, amen. You guys can be seated for just a moment. For those of you who are watching online, uh, we're going to end the live stream. Uh, The videos that we're about to see, we'll post those on Facebook. We'll also post those uh, in your email. 
Uh, so you can see these uh, introductions of deacon candidates. Uh, also, um, after the video is shown as you dismiss, we're going to be handing out the proposed budget for 2021. Uh, again, if you're watching online, this will be made available to you via email. Um, so be looking for that. But if you're watching online, we say uh, have a great week. We look forward to hopefully worshiping with you soon. Um, now.